drive, take it easy. In 1996, a pair of convicted felons escaped across the country. When a foreign military officer disappeared along their trail, authorities wondered if the armed fugitives had become killers. The FBI raced to find the escapees before more victims crossed their path. In Alabama, two desperate criminals fled the custody of a local deputy. Eluding authorities, they made their way across the country in a wave of car theft, abduction, and murder. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Escaped criminals believe they have nothing to lose. They'll do anything to avoid capture. After the convicts claimed their first victim, further bloodshed was inevitable, unless the FBI could find them and bring them to justice. Central Alabama, May 21, 1996. A DeKalb County deputy was assigned to transport three inmates from state prisons to face court dates. Michael Thompson was to be sentenced for murder. I don't know what it is. I always the deputy back knew back Thompson, back. having transported him before. Why are they putting you back up there for this? Thompson had persuaded the deputy to let him sit in the front seat. Thompson had just met another inmate, Roger Yaden. The career criminal had 17 burglary convictions and three prison escapes on his record. The third inmate was on work release. The prisoners were not handcuffed for the short drive. As the group neared Talladega, Alabama, Thompson made his move. At gunpoint, Thompson forced the deputy to keep driving. He ordered him to drive to a secluded area in the woods near Lincoln, Alabama. Thompson and Yaden freed themselves. They marched their hostages into the woods. Keep walking, speak cool with it, man. The men forced the deputy and the other inmate to strip out of their clothes. Shut up. The shoes, too. The deputy's extra handcuff key fell unnoticed to the ground. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Bound Sit in the down remote back. woods, the officer didn't know if he would be executed. Right, hurry up. Cut the clip. Let's go. Let's go. All right, I'll be riding with you again. Thanks. The two escapees simply ran off. Have anything to do with us, man. Michael Thompson and Roger Yaden took off in the direction of Talladega, leaving their prison clothes behind. It was Yaden's fourth escape from Alabama authorities. The deputy had to contact the sheriff's department. With a dropped handcuff key, he freed himself and the other inmate, then ran for help. Get out. The escaped convicts had the deputy's service weapon and a shotgun stored in the patrol car. 
Under the cover of law officers, the two felons endangered anyone in their path. The deputy and the remaining inmate had flagged down a motorist and reached the local police department. Police immediately issued an urgent be on the lookout alert for the two escapees in the stolen patrol car. One individual Thompson, six foot. The Calb County law enforcement launched a search. But the area contained hundreds of miles of rural roads. Despite the search, no sightings of the fugitives or the deputy's car came in that day. It wasn't until the evening that authorities received their first clue to Thompson's and Yaden's actions. A local paramedic contacted Talladega City Police and told them about his ordeal. He said that earlier that day, he was driving near Talladega when he noticed a sheriff's patrol car following him. When he heard the siren, the off-duty paramedic pulled over. He believed it was a routine stop. Officer asked for his license and wallet. Paramedic Bob Gortney didn't think he'd been speeding. The reason we pulled you over is your vehicle fits the description of a vehicle that was involved in a hit and run. And I told him, well, I haven't been in any accident. You know, you can check my truck, you can look around, it's not a scratch on it. And he said, well, your truck fits the description that we've got, and so we're going to, uh, you know, check it out. Gordney didn't suspect anything. No flags went off when he first walked up to me because he was in full uniform, had the badge and the name tag, and I really didn't make contact with the whole uniform. I seen the gun when he had his hand on it. Gordney gave the deputy his paramedic badge number, asking him to call in to verify his identity. But the deputy refused. Following the deputy's orders, the paramedic got into the patrol car. He believed it was simply a misunderstanding and that he would be released shortly. He said, well, we're going to carry you back over here to the accident scene. And I said, well, that's fine, you know. My truck doesn't fit the description, and we'll just get this cleared up. He first realized something was wrong when a man in civilian clothes carrying a shotgun ran from the patrol car to his truck. Okay, let's start with the man. From the description, police believe the man driving the pickup was Roger Yaden. They believe Michael Thompson was the one dressed as the deputy. Thompson followed the pickup with the paramedic locked in the back. What the deal is, you can have the truck. Courtney asked for an explanation. Keep it quiet. He said. We're just going to take your truck. And I knew right then it was a kidnapping. This guy's just kidnapped me. So I went into the plead mode, you know. I told him, I said, look, you know, I'm only 30 years old. I've got a wife and kids, and you have my truck, you have my gun. Um, there's no sense in killing me. Michael Thompson followed behind to an isolated spot off the highway. Roger Yaden had found the paramedic's 9mm handgun in the truck. Bob Gordney was helpless in the patrol car's locked back seat. The men forced him inside the cruiser's trunk. The kidnapped paramedic believed they were going to kill him. I was laying there at the point, so if I shot through the trunk, I knew they would miss me. You know, I, if 
a bullet was to come through, maybe it would graze me and not hit any vital organs. So I was trying to protect myself from the point of being shot through the trunk. And I could hear vehicles pass by, and then I heard my truck crank, and then I heard it sped off, and it was hot. I felt like I was suffocating. I kept thinking to myself, you need to slow down, because if you don't, you're gonna use up all your energy. And plus it's hot in here, I'm gonna dehydrate, and I'm probably gonna pass out. I was scared. I was shaking, and I was laying in the trunk, and I got to thinking, okay, you're a paramedic. You've educated people a thousand times. Now it's time for you to do what you've learned to get yourself out of this trunk, to educate yourself so you can still be alive. Using a jacket found in the trunk, Courtney worked for two hours. Finally, he popped the trunk open. He ran to the nearest house where a woman called police. An updated bulletin was issued for the pair of fugitives in the black pickup truck they were now driving. 232 to all units. This is a broadcast for 0900 suspect. They were two armed with two 9mm handguns and a shotgun. Authorities sped to the main interstate, figuring the fugitives would use it to flee the area. With a stolen truck full of gas and interstate highways nearby, law officers knew that Michael Thompson and Roger Yaden had a big lead on them. They could be anywhere. Seven days later and 1,200 miles away, an abandoned black pickup truck with no license plates turned up in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. The vehicle identification number on the dash had been destroyed. The police located a second identification number on the truck's chassis. A record search showed that it was the paramedics truck stolen in Alabama. Because of the interstate travel, the FBI was notified. An immediate search of the area revealed no sign of Michael Thompson or Roger Yaden. The armed fugitives had dumped the one vehicle investigators could trace. On June 7, 1996, the FBI in Birmingham, Alabama, filed a warrant for unlawful flight to avoid confinement. Police agencies across the country were notified to watch for any sign of Yaden and Thompson. Two weeks later, 1,200 miles east of where the paramedic's stolen truck was recovered in New Mexico, a group of diving students spotted a car at the bottom of Fowler Lake near Terre Haute, Indiana. Indiana Department of Natural Resources agent Dean Jenkins responded with his team. The car was laying, it was in about 25, 30 foot of water. It was on its top. The windshield had been broke out from when it sank. It apparently was uh, driven off the ramp. Indiana Department of Natural Resources officers dove into the lake to investigate. They found a red car with no license plates. Divers could see items from the vehicle, including traveler's checks resting on the bottom. There was no body nearby. The degree of personal items we found and, and what they were, traveler's checks, those kind of things that would ordinarily you would think would be stolen or discarded along the way prior to someone just dumping a stolen car. I think that was the key thing that made me wonder what else was involved with this vehicle. Investigators removed the car to process it on shore. In the trunk, technicians recovered a British passport for Army Major David Nichols. Traveler's checks and airline ticket stubs issued to the Major were found in the glove compartment. Among the items was an Alabama jail booking slip with a local Indiana name and address written on the back. Checking the car's identification number, investigators discovered it was a rental from Colorado reported missing along with the Major 16 days after he had rented it. The VIN number 
is 726JJ6. Because a foreign military officer was the likely victim of a crime, Supervisory Special Agent Jack Osborne from the FBI field office in Indianapolis was called in. He believed the name on the Alabama jail booking slip was the best lead in Major Nichols' disappearance. From the booking slip that was found in the car, on the back side was several handwritten notes, uh, not so much with phone numbers, but maybe somebody's first name and an address. Uh, one of those names and address led us to a relative uh, of Mr. Yaden, who resided in Terre Haute. The relative was an aunt of Roger Yaden's. He was one of two escaped convicts whom investigators had searched for in New Mexico. She told an agent that she did not know why her name was on the back of the Alabama jail booking slip. She also had no knowledge of Major Nichols, his red rental car, or that her nephew had escaped custody. She told us that she did have a nephew, Roger Dale Yaden, who she believed was in custody in Alabama and had communicated a lot with him in writing as her uh, children had. She did say that Yaden had some old friends in the area, but she couldn't recall their names. If Roger Yaden had made it to Indiana, the FBI believed murderer Michael Thompson was with him. They knew the pair of escaped convicts had already threatened to kill three others in Alabama and were last seen with two handguns and a shotgun. Agents feared that Roger Yaden and Michael Thompson may have used one of those weapons on the missing British major. In June of 1996, the FBI and Indiana police searched for armed fugitives Michael Thompson and Roger Yaden, who had escaped from Alabama authorities. They were considered prime suspects in the disappearance of British Army Major David Nichols, whose rental car was found at the bottom of an Indiana lake. According to FBI Supervisory Special Agent Jack Osborne, an Alabama jail booking slip found inside the car linked the fugitives to the missing major. The evidence certainly associated that vehicle with our missing major and that he was not in and around Terre Haute, nor was he located in the lake. It likewise then identified our two escaped prisoners that we believed were together and did have possession of the British Army officer's car and that they still possibly could be in the Terre Haute area. Agents went to the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. to find out more about the Major's travel itinerary. Sent to us prior to his arrival. The FBI needed to determine where and when Major Nichols may have crossed paths with the armed fugitives. The British government provided us some very basic information that indicated a, a British Army officer of theirs uh, had been in the United States arriving on the 20th of May arrived at Denver and was to travel to, uh, to New Mexico to attend a language school and then to Texas to attend a second school. On travel orders issued by NATO, Major David Nichols was scheduled to arrive at the first seminar in Albuquerque on May 26th. Nichols was a vice commander of the British Defense School of Languages, an expert linguist fluent in five languages. He told his wife and three children that he planned to sightsee for a few days before the seminar. But school officials in Albuquerque never heard from the major after he failed to arrive. The FBI felt it was uh, strange that the British Army officer had not attended school. Uh, the British government likewise, through contact they had with the family and friends of the uh, missing major, felt that it was strange that he had not been in contact with them, which then caused the British government great concern. Agent Osborne contacted the FBI field office in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Special Agent John Shum needed to determine where the Major was last seen in the 450 miles between Denver and Albuquerque. They gave us uh, his itinerary, photos, descriptions, um, uh, 
potential contacts here in the U.S. that he might have contacted once he, uh, once we couldn't find him where he was supposed to be. So uh, they gave us a complete, what we would call a victimology of him, uh, his background, uh, personality. Agents also checked the British Major's credit card purchases. Hey, how you doing? The last time he used his car was to buy gas in the small town of Raton on the Colorado-New Mexico border. Can I take a look at it, please? The gas station was just 150 miles from the place Michael Thompson and Roger Yaden, the escaped fugitives from Alabama, had abandoned the black pickup truck they had stolen. Agents wanted to confirm how far the British Major had traveled past Raton. Yes, please. They checked at a hotel in Old Town, Albuquerque, where the Major had made advance reservations. He never showed up, and his reservation was never canceled. The Major had disappeared somewhere between the gas station near the Colorado border, where his credit card had been used, and the hotel in Albuquerque. The FBI suspected Michael Thompson and Roger Yaden had abducted him, but they had vanished too. Agent Shum called the Major's wife in England to find out more about how her husband may have reacted if accosted by two desperate criminals. She told me he was a very gentle man. He was a very good man and that if he was confronted with these, by these people, that he would not have been confrontational. He would have been willing to do what they say, give them anything they want, just to avoid a confrontation. Uh, and she said that uh, he would have been very concerned about, uh, about his safety and being able to make it back to England to uh, help raise his, his boys. 1,200 miles away in Indiana, close to the lake where the Major's car was found. Local police received a call from a junkyard manager who reported seeing two suspicious men on his property. When the officer arrived, the two men fled from a pickup truck loaded with scrap metal. It was unsafe for a lone officer to follow two men into the woods. He called in the truck's license plate numbers and learned the vehicle had been stolen. Crime scene technicians processed the truck. They found a tag from a video camera strap that belonged to Major David Nichols. They also recovered a letter that was addressed to fugitive Roger Yaden's mother in Alabama. And it was generally saying that, that he was out of prison and was generally going to be staying in the Terre Haute area. When agents contacted Yaden's mother in Alabama, she said she hadn't no, heard from her son no. and had no idea where no. he might be. No, things, things are going fine. Investigators were sure the fugitives were soon. nearby. We got both uh, your photographs. The items that were recovered in that truck were extremely important because it not only associated Yaden and Thompson with that vehicle, it also uh, associated the missing major with that vehicle. It was more compelling evidence that Yaden and Thompson were likely responsible for the major's disappearance. But the armed fugitives were moving fast, and the FBI was still one step behind. In the summer of 1996, the FBI continued their hunt for escaped Alabama convicts Michael Thompson and Roger Yaden. Agents suspected they had carjacked a British man who was still missing, then dumped his rental car in a lake near Terre Haute, Indiana, where Roger Yaden had relatives. At a nearby high school, the FBI and Indiana investigators had established a satellite command post. They received a court order to examine Yaden's local juvenile record. They noticed that Yaden often got into trouble with one particular friend. 
checking the friend's background, they learned that he managed a nearby auto salvage yard. Indianapolis FBI Special Agent William Hamilton would chase the lead. My partner and I decided that we would drive a unmarked vehicle into this area in an undercover capacity under the ruse of looking for a specific auto part. The five-acre property was a good hiding place. It was filled with a maze of cars surrounded by dense woods. Agents staked out the location. I, I just haven't seen anything in a while. They needed to confirm that Yaden's childhood friend was on duty. In order to assure their identities would not be discovered, they left their badges and weapons in their vehicle. After going all the way to the far south end of the salvage yard, we noticed a trailer back in the woods, and uh, there was two white males there working. The men fit the general description of the armed fugitives, but the unarmed agents could not be sure. Hello. They hoped to learn more from the manager. The undercover agents engaged him in small talk and confirmed that he was a friend of Roger Yaden's. The uh, childhood friend, uh, he indicated that he'd known Yaden for several years. They had both came to his residence in early June, and they showed up there in a red Taurus. That car matched the description of the missing major's vehicle. By the time the agents finished their conversation, the two men they had glimpsed earlier were gone. The FBI believed those two men had been Thompson and Yaden. After assembling an arrest team, agents and local officers raced back to the salvage yard. On the way, they noticed a pickup speeding in the opposite direction. One agent spotted Roger Yaden inside, traveling with the salvage yard manager. They couldn't see if Michael Thompson was also with them. Investigators gave chase. They trailed the truck to a dead end. Yaden jumped out and headed for the woods. fugitive's childhood friend was detained for questioning. He said Yaden had forced him to lead police on a chase until he could jump out of the truck. Assured he had not intentionally harbored the suspects, police later released the friend. The childhood friend knew nothing of their recent criminal behavior. He had only knew that Yaden had been in jail once for burglary. Roger Yaden had eluded pursuing investigators. A canine unit was called in to track him. The highly trained dog picked up a scent. Mike. 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 <laughs> On July 2nd, 1996, Roger Yaden decided he was finished running. But his accomplice, convicted murderer Michael Thompson, was still at large. Having Yaden in custody was only a partial victory, according to FBI Special Agent Jack Osborne. After Yaden's arrest, this is not over at all. We know that we're now dealing with another fugitive, maybe the worst of the two fugitives, we do not know where he's at. If he's still on the property, if he's in the trailer, if he's in the woods, if he has a weapon or not. Suspecting Michael Thompson took refuge in the auto salvage yard's trailer, law enforcement teams surrounded it. Thompson, this is Special Agent Hamilton with the FBI. You are surrounded, I repeat, with the FBI. They ordered him to come out unarmed. 
Agents warned anyone inside that the trailer would be tear gassed. Again, I repeat, we are going to fire tear gas. There was no response. With your hands up. The atmosphere was very tense. Uh, we did not know if Thompson was inside the trailer with a maybe a long gun or even a, a handgun, you know, positioned on some of our people. So we had to maintain cover at, at, all around the perimeter of the trailer. Come out with your hands up. You will not be harmed. Authorities gave the signal to use the gas. escaped murderer Michael Thompson was armed and barricaded inside. Thompson, I repeat, Thompson, you need to come out. On July 2nd, 1996, after capturing Alabama dead. fugitive Roger Yaden in Indiana, FBI agents stormed a salvage yard trailer where they believed his partner was hiding. But Indiana Department of Natural Resources agent Dean Jenkins and his team did not find convicted killer Michael Thompson inside. That was a terrible disappointment because we figured we were on to him. We caught one. We were looking to get the other one and pretty much make it, uh, make it a clean sweep, and he wasn't in there. Agents questioned the salvage yard manager, a childhood friend of Yaden's who had unknowingly harbored the fugitives. He said he had no idea where Thompson might be hiding, but he did show agents where Yaden and Thompson kept their belongings. From the trunk of a car, agents retrieved a suitcase labeled with the name of missing British Major David Nichols. The Major's clothes and personal effects were still inside. Agents believed the fugitives had carjacked the Major in New Mexico. The search team secured a three-mile perimeter around the salvage yard and told the man to call immediately if he spotted Thompson. We used canines and uh, broke up into teams of three and four officers uh, with canines and searched the area, ran tracks all throughout uh, the lot, the salvage yard area, and then the uh, surrounding woods looking for him, and that, that took an awfully long time. That went from the time they inserted the gas in the afternoon uh, well past uh, darkness. With a convicted killer on the loose, FBI and local law enforcement could not afford to wait. They patrolled roadways and fields, hoping to flush Thompson from hiding. Despite hours of searching, the fugitive had eluded them once again. In the morning, agents considered the possibility that Thompson may have somehow slipped past the perimeter. They had no way of knowing if he was still in the immediate area. Then Special Agent William Hamilton got the call they were hoping for. All right, good. Listen, don't go near him. We're going to be there. On July the 3rd, the morning following the arrest of uh, Roger Yaden, the childhood friend of Yaden telephoned me and advised me that the subject, Thompson, was asleep in the junkyard in the back of one of the cars near his residence, the trailer. The team was concerned that Thompson would be armed. There was no telling what the desperate fugitive would do when cornered. Exhausted from running, the killer gave up without a fight. After 43 days, 6,000 miles, and thousands of man hours, the last fugitive wanted in Major Nichols' disappearance was in custody. Thompson refused to talk to investigators. 
But Roger Yaden, apprehended the day before, felt differently. Hoping for leniency from federal authorities, Yaden agreed to tell investigators what they wanted to know. FBI Special Agent Jack Osborne led the questioning. He indicated a willingness to uh, give us a statement to provide uh, all of the information that he and Thompson were involved in to include the initial escape, to include uh, the carjacking uh, in Alabama. And this is the first time that we learned that the British Army officer had been killed. In the black pickup the pair had carjacked from Alabama, the fugitives made their way to New Mexico, selling tools from the truck for money. When their cash ran out, they decided to rob and carjack another victim. They staked out a remote rest area 100 miles south of Raton, New Mexico, the last known town where British Major Nichols had traveled. The convicts figured that tourists would be traveling with a lot of money and waited for someone who was traveling alone. That's when the British Major pulled up. As they had done in Alabama, they forced their victim into the trunk of the car. Thompson drove the Major's rental car, while Yaden followed in the truck. From Yaden's account, the British Major reacted to the crime as the Major's wife had predicted he would, according to Special Agent John Shum. Everything she said about him is exactly what Yaden told us happened, that uh, Major Nichols was non-confrontational, he did what he could to um, keep the situation from escalating. He talked about uh, his three boys in England, about how he needed to to get back there for them, and he he asked that he not be hurt because he was concerned about uh, what would happen to his children. Yaden said Thompson had planned the whole thing and that he was calling the shots. They drove 50 miles until it was dark, then pulled into a deserted area off the highway. At gunpoint, Thompson forced Major Nichols out of the trunk. Without warning, he shot him in the back of the head. Thompson turned the major over and shot again. They hid his body at the site, then abandoned the pickup truck several miles away. Yaden said Thompson never explained why he had killed this carjacking victim. You didn't have me killed. The pair of fugitives drove Major Nichols' car to Indiana, where they dumped it in Fowler Lake. Roger Yaden had confessed his crimes to the FBI, but he wanted a deal before he gave up the location of Major Nichols' body. He wanted to hold back until he could get some assurance from the government that we would not seek the death penalty against him. If that occurred, then uh, he was willing to help us find the body of the missing Major if we had not located the body already. All right, so let's talk about this deal. What are you, what are you looking for here? Agents met with Yaden and his lawyer. What kind of time are you talking about? The prisoner said he would tell them where the body was sure if they ready. also promised he would not serve time in an Alabama state prison. And you want the federal. What's going on? 
We need to know. Initial searches without his help turned up nothing. FBI Special Agent John Shum was worried the Major's body would not be found without Yaden's help. I don't, I don't follow this. What, what, what is the deal? The most important thing for us to do was find Major Nichols' body. Uh, that was going to be important to, to be successful in any prosecution. And it was important for us because it was the right thing to do. Uh, it, since this man, since we couldn't make him safe in this country, since we couldn't guarantee his safety, at least we could return his body to his family. So what are we going to get out of this? You're asking for a federal facility. Federal prosecutors agreed to the deal. Yaden led investigators to a secluded spot in the New Mexico wilderness. The prisoner was an accomplished escape artist, having fled custody more than once. Well, we were very concerned about that because he had escaped four times before in Alabama. Uh, he was obviously very good at that. Plus, we had to be concerned about our own safety. So. Uh, not only did we focus on the mission of finding Major Nichols' body, but we had to be very, very concerned about making sure Roger Yaden was not trying to uh, deceive us and just using this as a ruse to set up an escape attempt. FBI field agents were wary as a SWAT team secured the location. They had no way of knowing if Yaden might have friends in the area waiting to strike at agents. On September 24, 1996, recaptured prisoner Roger Yaden led the FBI into the New Mexico desert, where he claimed the body of Major David Nichols remained hidden after being murdered. Yaden would be spared the death penalty if he could locate the remains. FBI Special Agent John Shum recalls that the likelihood of finding the body without Yaden's help was slim. It was a, a very desolate area. It was off of a very little used two-lane highway in New Mexico in a very remote area. And then off this two-lane highway, we had to go down a gravel road for approximately a mile. And then off the gravel road, we had to drive into a cattle pasture for several hundred yards. So it was incredibly remote. Agents were concerned that Yaden had taken them there as a ruse to effect another escape. Finally, Yaden pointed out a spot to the agents. There it is. And even Yaden himself seemed very uh, somber and respectful of, of the situation we were in, that we had finally located this man's body, and we're going to able to be able to uh, to uh, give him a, a proper resting place now. Did you say something about exposure that? to the elements made identification impossible? Examiners took dental X-rays, which were later matched to records sent from England. Right, right. Major Nichols' family in Britain was notified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The officer's murderer, Michael Thompson, avoided a possible death sentence by pleading guilty in federal court to carjacking and murdering a foreign official. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. For kidnapping, robbery, and escape in Alabama, Thompson received five additional life sentences. In exchange for his cooperation, Roger Yaden was allowed to plead guilty to only one count of carjacking and was sentenced to 18 years. Yaden was afraid of Alabama State Prison. As part of his deal, he was to serve his sentence in a federal facility. Yaden, time to get up. He was temporarily held at a county jail in Las Vegas, New Mexico until he could be transferred. Hey, let's go. Hey, get up. 
Come on, get up. Remarkably, Roger Yaden had escaped again. Two other inmates also made the breakout with Yaden. Hey. A search party with a dog team tracked Yaden's scent from jail. But the trail ended at an interstate highway. Later that day, authorities captured one of two other inmates who escaped with Yaden. Go ahead. The inmate had injured his leg in the attempt and was unable to get far on foot. He explained to authorities how they got out. He said that Yaden had designed the plan. In the jail's black market, he bartered for an Allen wrench and a hacksaw. Yaden unlocked maintenance panels to gain access to air ducts that led to the roof. He cut through ductwork, then the roof to get outside. The fourth man stayed behind to replace the panel. The escapees moved along the roof of the jail, then jumped over the wall. Once on the outside, the inmates said they split up. That was the last time he saw Yaden. Prison officials called FBI Special Agent John Shum to give him the bad news. And once I heard Yaden escaped yet again from federal custody, my first reaction was I was very angry because here was a guy that had a history of having escaped numerous times in the past. The people that were responsible for his custody knew his history and they should have been more careful. Investigators believed Yaden would likely head toward family and friends in DeKalb County, Alabama. Have you seen Roger lately? No. Agents interviewed anyone Yaden might have contacted in the area, including an ex-girlfriend. Have you talked to him on the phone? Letter? No letter. Like the others, she said she hadn't seen or heard from him. They left a card and told her to call if Yaden surfaced. After the agents left, she admitted to her current boyfriend that she had let Yaden hide in her house. It was an accident. He was upstairs in the attic. The boyfriend was upset and called police. Nearby officers responded. They didn't know if Yaden was armed and waiting for them. Five weeks after his escape from New Mexico, officers finally cornered Roger Yaden. Captured in DeKalb County, Alabama, Roger Yaden's crime spree ended where it began. His escape nullified the deal with federal prosecutors. He was charged with the crimes he had committed during his last escape from Alabama. Alabama Assistant Attorney General David Estes prosecuted Yaden in Talladega. The jury in this case deliberated for a very short period of time, at the, an hour at the most, and they came back and they convicted Roger Dale Yaden of three counts of kidnapping in the first degree, two counts of robbery in the first degree, and one count of escape in the first degree. Yaden received five concurrent life sentences without parole. Now in maximum lockdown, Roger Yaden will never leave Alabama prison alive. In 1992, 
a young mother was gunned down in front of her children. Police searched for answers but found nothing. Then family members offered a startling clue. It would take local and federal agents to untangle an intricate web of money, drugs, and murder to capture the architects of a heartbreaking crime. Two young boys were the only witnesses to their mother's murder. The horrible crime appeared unmotivated, senseless, and random. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The victim, the wife of a prominent Atlanta attorney, was also a woman burdened with a secret. The FBI believed that secret led to her death. They hoped its discovery would also lead to her killer. November 29, 1992, Atlanta, Georgia. Travelers returned home at the end of the Thanksgiving holiday. 39-year-old Sarah Tokars and her two children had spent the long weekend with her parents in Florida. Her husband, a well-known lawyer and judge, was away on business. After a nine-hour drive, they arrived safely in their suburban Atlanta neighborhood of Marietta. The house was dark as they pulled into the driveway. But it was not empty. Sarah did not see a man waiting in the shadows of the garage. He brandished a weapon. The gunman forced Sarah back into the SUV. The terrified woman had a six-year-old at her side and a four-year-old still asleep in the car. She had no choice. The man put his gun to Sarah's head and told her to drive towards the city. Make this left now, this left. She followed instructions. As they reached an empty development, he told her to turn off. She refused. She pleaded with him to let her children go. with a single gunshot to her head. As the gunman grabbed her purse and fled, the vehicle kept rolling. The children still inside. When it came to a stop, Sarah's six-year-old son had to reach across his mother's body to turn off the ignition. He unbuckled his groggy four-year-old brother from his car seat then ran to the nearest house. There, a neighbor called 911. Officers responded to the report of a possible homicide in the vicinity of Powers Road. Cobb County Police were dispatched immediately. Homicide detectives arrived as officers fanned out to search for the gunman. Police briefed them on the spot. The two young boys who witnessed the shooting identified the victim as their mother, Sarah Tokars. Their father, Fred Tokars, was out of town. Police were already trying to contact him. 
Forensic technicians examined the vehicle where it had stopped. There might be trace evidence outside as well as inside the car. An analysis confirmed what the boys had told police. The gunman was sitting directly behind Sarah Tokars when he pulled the trigger. Blood spatter pattern suggested he had used a shotgun. Detectives knew it would be difficult to get detailed information from children so young, especially after such a traumatic experience. The oldest one, six years old, would try his best. He said the killer was a black male, wearing jeans, a sweatshirt, and a cap. He could not be more specific. The boy didn't know which way the killer had run after he grabbed his mother's purse. But he said the weapon looked like a pirate's gun that you would see on TV. Detectives were not sure what he meant. Maybe the autopsy would tell them more. Detectives tracked down relatives living in the area to take custody of the boys until their father could be located. Police learned the family's address by running the plates on the vehicle. They continued the investigation at the Tokar's home where the abduction had occurred. In the living room, they found a security dowel lying next to a sliding glass door. The killer had likely entered the house here. The home security system had not been activated. Right here, let's get some photographs. No alarm sounded as the intruder entered. And then after that, I want you to go ahead and process it. Perhaps a burglar had taken advantage of the lax security, and Sarah surprised him when she returned home. Whoever the burglar was, he hadn't left any trace evidence at the Tokar's home. There was little to go on, according to Cobb County Chief Detective Arthur Allred. At this point, we just really didn't know what happened. Uh, this was uh, in a upper middle class neighborhood. Uh, this was a, uh, a, a a mother with her two children, and this kind this type of crime was just just didn't occur in this area at all. Uh, the most serious crime we had probably vandalism. Uh, so initially, uh, we were really baffled as, as to what had happened and, wh and why. Sarah's eldest son worked with a police sketch artist and described the man in the dark who had killed his mother. The drawing of a thin black man wearing a knit hat was released to the public. But the six-year-old's description was too vague to elicit any viable leads. The victim's husband, Fred Tokars, was contacted at his hotel in Montgomery, Alabama. He returned to Atlanta immediately. As a criminal defense attorney, Tokars was aware he would be considered an early suspect in his wife's murder. He had his own attorney present when he spoke to authorities. They quickly established his alibi so police could pursue more promising leads. Detectives confirmed that at the time of the murder, Fred Tokars was in Alabama. He had been visiting a client incarcerated in the Montgomery jail. The grieving husband assured police that he and Sarah had a strong marriage. He would do anything he could to help find her killer. Tokars agreed to walk detectives through the house. As far as he knew, the doors were locked and the security rod was in place when he left for Montgomery. 
He explained that they had intentionally left the alarm off because a plumber was scheduled to fix the hot water heater over the weekend. Tokars led detectives to the basement where he kept his home office. He said he usually had about $1,500 locked in the safe. Now it was open and empty. I do keep some cash in there. Its combination was hidden in a nearby file. Only he and his wife knew it was there. Perhaps Sarah had taken the money on her trip to Florida. It was also possible that the burglar had found the combination and taken the cash. Ultimately, Tokars couldn't specify how much money, if any, was missing. All right. To police, to nothing else in the house seemed disturbed, and no clues pointed to the killer's identity. A lot of people were frightened. Uh, a lot of people were just couldn't believe that this would happen to a mother in front of her children, and especially in the neighborhood where it occurred. So there was a lot of... Uh, 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 a lot of pressure on the department to, to, to find who had killed her. Police hoped the coroner's report would give them more. Lab examiners confirmed that Sarah Tokers had been killed with a 410 shotgun. To a child, if that type of weapon had been sawed off, it might look like a 17th century flintlock pistol used by pirates on TV. Only the plastic wadding and buckshot were recovered from the SUV. It might be a 410 or maybe a 20 gauge. Because no shell casing had been ejected, they would not be able to match anything to a specific weapon if one were later found. Maybe 410. get to the ballistics for you. The examiner discovered no foreign hairs, fibers, or fingerprints on the body or clothing. The anonymous killer had left nothing that could lead investigators to his identity. Former assistant United States attorney Buddy Parker, like many members of the Atlanta community, was stunned by the news of the murder. We had a discussion uh, that morning about the notoriety of the homicide, of it being the wife of Fred Tokars, who was known uh, within the legal community, uh, having been a former assistant district attorney for Fulton County. Uh, I was familiar with uh, Fred Tokars in his role as a criminal defense lawyer in a matter that was then pending in our office, a matter regarding um, the investigation of a particular drug dealer. Fred Tokars' lucrative criminal defense practice brought him into contact with many men accused of federal drug charges. Rarely does such a murder have a simple motive. Solving the case would not be easy. The following day, two women came to the Cobb County Police Station. Sarah Tokar's sister and her cousin had a file they needed to show detectives. Sarah had entrusted her sister with the file three years earlier. At the time, Sarah made her promise to take it to police if anything ever happened to her. It contained what appeared to be lists of Fred Tokar's bank accounts and their balances. The women suggested that the papers might be related to Sarah's attempt to divorce Fred. Her sister's marriage was not as strong as Fred had led police to believe. Sarah wanted a divorce, but whenever she broached the subject, he threatened to use his legal connections to get sole custody of their children. Sarah was trapped. If she ever hoped to divorce Fred and keep her children, she needed leverage. After the incident, Sarah had secretly copied some of Fred's files and gave them to her sister for safekeeping. She suspected they outlined illegal activities he might be involved in. If that were so, they could be her only leverage against him in court. Investigators reviewed the files carefully. 
Perhaps they would help police determine whether Sarah Tokar's death was a botched robbery or a carefully planned conspiracy. Cobb County detectives called the FBI office in Atlanta for help. They hoped that Special Agent Michael Twible could determine if Fred Tokar's bank statements were somehow linked to the murder. We were contacted by the Cobb County authorities uh, concerning the documents they had discovered, which were brought to them by uh, Sarah Tokar's sister and cousin, which revealed that Mr. Tokar's her husband had been involved in setting up offshore bank accounts and offshore corporations. It would take time for Agent Twible and his team to unravel the names and finances on those documents to see if they had something or nothing to do with the death of Sarah Tokars. On December 3, 1997, four days after the shooting, Sarah Tokars was laid to rest. Her two children were left motherless. Investigators still had no leads that pointed to the identity of her killer. Whoever had killed the young mother was still out on the streets. Just after Thanksgiving in 1997, the FBI and local investigators continued their search for the lone gunman who shot and killed Sarah Tokars, the wife of a prominent Atlanta attorney, in front of her two young children. Sarah's six-year-old child had given a vague description of the suspect to police in Cobb County, Georgia, but they still had no solid leads. Copies of her husband's bank statements were sent to the FBI field office in Atlanta for closer scrutiny. Special Agent Michael Twible hoped to provide insight as to whether the documents might somehow be connected to Sarah Tokar's murder. Once we reviewed these documents, it revealed that Mr. Tokars had set up offshore banks and corporations, not only in the Turk and Caicos, but in Montserrat and in the Bahamas. Uh, these documents also showed that he had set up numerous corporations in nominees' names in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Nominees are people who, in name only, head dummy corporations for purposes of money laundering. Although Fred Tokars had never been accused of money laundering himself, he was an expert on the subject. Buddy Parker, a former assistant U.S. attorney, was aware that Tokars was not only a well-known lawyer, he was also a certified public accountant. Fred Tokars was known within the Atlanta legal community as uh, a person who held himself out to be uh, an expert in uh, money laundering uh, and in fact conducted uh, lectures for law enforcement authorities uh, at the state level uh, on money laundering. Investigating the finances of a man like Fred Tokars would be a delicate business. He was well-liked and well-connected among Atlanta's power elite. He was well-known in Cobb County. He was also well-known in uh, political circles in as much as he had been appointed as an assistant municipal court judge and he had been an assistant uh, solicitor for Fulton County. He had uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, friends in high political places and helped on numerous campaigns uh, of, of state and local uh, officials. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any... Uh, Investigators again met with Tokars and his attorney. They told him they believed his business dealings could be connected to his wife's killing and asked him about his clients. Has your wife mentioned anything to you about anyone that she... Fred Tokars admitted several were violent drug dealers who operated in dangerous circles. One in particular was reputed to have been a major cocaine supplier in the Atlanta area. The dealer had returned home to Detroit after another one of Tokar's clients had allegedly forced him out of the South. Not long after, 
he was gunned down in front of his mother's home. The murder weapon, a handgun found later in a nearby alley, had been traced back to a gun shop north of Atlanta. Tokar suggested that the dealer's remaining crew, or even those who murdered him, could have had Sarah killed to send a message to the lawyer. We can arrange something and get it over to you. Detectives secured a warrant to search the attorney's office to see if they could find any link to the killer in his papers. That night, local investigators and IRS agents conducted a thorough search of the office. They confiscated files, date books, and business calendars dating back several years, but found no direct clues to the murder. In the margins of Tokar's date books, agents did find notations of offshore accounts. The total deposited in these accounts far exceeded the amount Tokar's claimed on his taxes each year. It looked as if Fred Tokar's had used his expertise in money laundering to his own financial advantage. Local and federal officials met with representatives of the Atlanta United States Attorney's Office. They suspected Fred Tokar's illegal activities went far beyond money laundering. Money laundering was already on our radar screen, if you will. Secondly, now we have evidence coming out of the Tokar's home of offshore bank accounts. With those two clear facts, uh, we felt that there was a firm basis to open an investigation formally on Fred Tokar's. Parker learned that in August of 1992, the DEA had arrested one of Tokar's clients in a sting operation. His name was Anthony Brown. Brown had a reputation as a cocaine dealer in Atlanta. The day before, agents had intercepted one of his couriers in Texas and seized more than 100 kilos of cocaine. Inside the trunk of Brown's car, agents found $50,000 in cash. They also found documents revealing Fred Tokars was more than Brown's defense attorney. He had incorporated an Atlanta nightclub for the drug dealer. It was believed by law enforcement that the nightclub was a front to help launder the drug proceeds of the drug trafficking organization that Brown was a member of. DEA agent Jeff Dahlman had participated in the sting operation to arrest Brown. Parker hoped Dahlman's drug trafficking case would help with the murder investigation. What had happened as a result of the homicide of Mrs. Tokars was that the light got turned on Fred Tokars' past of what, what he had been doing for the past several years. And what was illuminated was that he'd been involved with several drug traffickers in the Atlanta area. Investigators wondered how deep that involvement went. Police re-interviewed Tokars' neighbors to see if they had missed anything. One close friend confirmed that Sarah wanted to divorce her husband, but she was afraid of him. Not long before she was murdered, Sarah confided that she had found some of her husband's documents that seemed suspicious. According to the neighbor, Sarah said these weren't simply lists of offshore accounts. They were stronger proof of criminal activities. Hey, listen, I need to give you a call back. Yeah, just a few About a week and a half before okay. Sarah Tokars' uh, murder, uh, Sarah Tokars uh, explained to her uh, that she now had the goods on Fred, that she had found documents or records that indicated he had engaged in or was engaging in tax evasion, and that she, uh, she was going to go to the authorities with this information and she could then get a divorce. If Sarah had confronted her husband with the evidence, it might have motivated him to harm her. Investigators additionally found the name of a Tokar's private investigator. The PI admitted to agents that Tokar's had hired him to approach drug dealers about laundering their profits. 
He was listed as one of the owners, along with Fred Tokars, of another Atlanta nightclub, according to Special Agent Michael Twible. We determined that he was an owner of a company, but through our further investigation, we realized that he was a nominee. And when I say the word nominee, I mean the fact that he was delegated to the person being legally responsible as being an owner of the club, but he, in actuality, he was not. Fred Tokars had constructed the entire scheme. According to the private eye, Tokars courted reputed drug dealers like Anthony Brown, men who had a lot of cash, but no place to invest it without raising suspicions of the IRS. Tokars, a money laundering expert, proposed depositing their drug profits in offshore accounts and in businesses like clubs that operated primarily on a cash basis. The money could then be filtered through legitimate financial institutions. And the way you would launder the money is even though it's dealt in, in cash, you would pay entertainers on paper $15,000 when in actuality you paid them $5,000 cash. Tokars would receive thousands for each transaction. He was actively involved knowing that these people were drug traffickers and what they were doing with their money. The object was to open corporations, mainly nightclubs, cash businesses where they could easily hide their assets, where they could easily run their drug proceeds through them. Authorities believe the connection between Fred Tokars and drug traffickers had somehow led to his wife's murder. But the details were elusive. Not. Get back in that car now. Weeks no. after the murder of Sarah Tokars, a man capable of murdering an innocent mother in front of her children remained at large. Got a shotgun blast in the back of the By December 1992, several weeks after Sarah Tokars was killed, federal and state authorities had still not found the lone gunman and still had no clues to his identity. Shortly before she was brutally murdered, Sarah believed she had discovered papers in her husband's law office that documented his illegal activities. Former U.S. prosecutor Buddy Parker believed that Sarah had likely threatened to expose Fred Tokars with those documents unless he agreed to a divorce. That began to give us a feeling that uh, Sarah Tokars was murdered to keep her mouth shut about her knowledge or her belief about her husband's role and involvement in laundering drug money for drug traffickers. Fred Tokars not only represented violent drug dealers, he had gone into business with them. Investigators now had evidence Tokars' clients were laundering money through several nightclubs. If his wife had threatened to expose him, Tokars, as well as his clients, had a lot to lose. The FBI took a hard look at the nightclubs the attorney had incorporated. Special Agent Michael Twibel had to wade through piles of state records, searching for a name that could link Tokars directly to the murder. We started reviewing uh, company and corporation records and uh, liquor license and business license that uh, Mr. Tokars had incorporated. We started looking at these different clubs uh, to see actually who owned them. Major drug suppliers like Al Brown contributed the funds. A middleman purchased the clubs. And Tokar set up the entire deal, as DEA agent Jeff Dolman discovered. They didn't really trust Mr. Tokars to launder money in offshore bank accounts. It was too elaborate. They wanted their money where they could touch it, where they could feel it, where they could use it every day, where they could buy cars with it. And so the, the laundering, in essence, in this investigation turned towards the laundering of money through nightclubs, through incorporation of the nightclubs. FBI agents interviewed employees of the nightclubs. Over time, they were able to piece together the structure of the business, its owners, and its profits. 
To attorney Parker, it was like assembling a complex puzzle. The picture of how uh, the night cub money laundering was structured was really developed through insiders, through inside drug traffickers who ultimately decided to cut plea agreements with us and to cooperate and provide evidence. But nothing from the nightclubs pointed to Sarah Tokar's killer. After months of frustration, Cobb County Police finally got a break. A detective working on the case got a tip from his brother, a deputy in nearby Fulton County. The deputy remembered seeing Fred Tokar's name in the file for a businessman who had an outstanding arrest warrant. The businessman's name was Eddie Lawrence, wanted for writing bad checks on one of Tokar's accounts. Of all Tokar's business associates and clients, Eddie Lawrence was a name he had never mentioned to police. Authorities quickly learned that Eddie Lawrence and Fred Tokars were involved in several businesses together. These included construction, renovation, and mortgage companies. Tokars had also defended Lawrence in several minor brushes with the law. It was a long shot, but it was the only lead they had left. Eddie Lawrence had, through Fred Tokar, has been granted access to some of the uh, some of the uh, most prominent individuals within the city. Uh, Fred would take Eddie to some of the big political fundraising functions, and and all of a sudden Eddie was, like I said, he's very presentable. He he could certainly uh, mingle and 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 uh, not be embarrassed at cocktail functions and things, and and engage in conversations and. And so he, he was living this wonderful life, and the way he got there was through Fred Tokars. A few days later, the young businessman agreed to questioning after police discovered records of calls between he and Tokars on the day of the murder. Eddie Lawrence said he had been in business with Fred Tokars for almost a year. He claimed the phone calls were all job-related. He knew nothing about Sarah Tokar's murder. The detectives had Lawrence arrested on the bad check charge and then released him on bond. They wanted to see which one of Tokar's associates got nervous when they heard Lawrence was being investigated. The plan worked. The confidential informant contacted police. The word on the street was that Eddie Lawrence had been looking for a hitman prior to Sarah Tokar's murder. He had pressured one of his employees to help him find someone to kill a woman who he claimed stood in the way of a lot of money. The employee gave Lawrence a name, Curtis Rower. Rower was a drug addict with a long rap sheet including armed robbery. He needed money. Maybe he'd be interested. Although the informant didn't mention Fred Tokars by name, investigators finally had a potential link between the victim's husband, Eddie Lawrence, and a hitman. Detectives interviewed Eddie Lawrence. No, I deny. They questioned him about his relationship with Tokars. Why would I have somebody he claimed no involvement in the murder. When I had nobody on. Police felt he was lying. On December 16, 1992, police detained Lawrence and revoked his bail because of the flight risk. They wanted him in custody when they went after Curtis Rower. Detectives immediately secured search and arrest warrants for a house in College Park where Rower was staying. They proceeded with caution. If Rower was capable of killing an innocent woman in cold blood, there was no telling what he might do when cornered.
On December 22, 1992, three weeks after a mother of two was murdered, Cobb County police circled a home in College Park to arrest suspected hitman Curtis Rower. The woman who answered the door said she wasn't sure if Rower was home. An initial sweep of the house produced nothing. Still, they kept up their guard. One officer thought he heard movement in a bedroom. It was Curtis Rower. He was unarmed. Lay down, all the way down. Spread your hands out. Keep them spread. Rower was booked and charged with murder. He claimed that Eddie Lawrence, Fred Tokar's business partner, had offered him $5,000 to kill Sarah Tokar's, but Rower was too scared to go through with it. He said Lawrence was the one who had caused Sarah's death. Rower admitted that he had carjacked the family. But when Sarah Tokar stopped, he said that he couldn't pull the trigger. At that moment, Eddie Lawrence ran up to the car, screaming for Rower to shoot. Lawrence grabbed the shotgun and it went off, killing Sarah Tokar's. Both men then fled in Lawrence's car. Though police believed Rower was downplaying his role, Sarah's six-year-old son was the only other witness they had to refute his claim. He remembered only one shooter. The boy would be forced to identify the man who terrorized his family from a lineup unless Eddie Lawrence corroborated Rower's story. Authorities charged Eddie Lawrence with conspiracy to commit murder, but Lawrence refused to confirm or deny Rower's statement. Hello? Cobb yes. County Police notified Fred Tokars that Eddie Lawrence and Curtis Rower had been formally charged with his wife's murder. He received the news at Sarah's parents' house in Florida, where he was vacationing with his sons for the holidays. Who was on the phone? It's the police. They have arrested someone for the murder. So. Ah, thank God for that. His relatives later said that while the rest of the family expressed relief, Fred Tokars did not. He seemed despondent. The arrests of Lawrence and Rower had made national headlines. Tokars was caught in that same spotlight and refused to give any statements to the press. Because the suspected hitman's story conflicted with Tokars' son's version, the six-year-old was asked to view a suspect lineup. Police explained that though he would be able to see five men staring at him, they would not be able to see him. The one-way mirror would prevent that. When the child said he was ready, investigators called for the men. All of them resembled the boy's description of his mother's killer. Okay, Michael. One of these gentlemen may be the first. Detectives reassured him that he could take as much time as he needed. But it was no use. The child was either too young or too frightened to remember the killer's face. When relatives tried to reach Fred Tokars in Florida to inform him, he was nowhere to be found. Fred left the company of his in-laws and returned to his, his hotel room uh, where uh, no one heard from him. And the following morning, they tried to uh, 
raise him on the telephone. They tried to find him, and there were no responses. Concerned, Sarah's father rushed to the hotel where Tokars was staying. Fred Tokars had swallowed a handful of sleeping pills and washed it down with beer. The manager of the hotel quickly called an ambulance. He had uh, apparently attempted to take his life after hearing that, that Eddie Lawrence, uh, uh, this, this uh, business partner of his, uh, had been arrested for the murder of his, of his wife. Sarah's father found a note written in Fred Tokar's handwriting on the table beside the bed. In the locked hotel room, Fred Tokar's wrote a long, rambling note, apologizing for the pain and suffering his lifestyle had inflicted upon his family. He wrote that Sarah was a great woman. Then on the day before Christmas Eve, Fred Tokar swallowed a handful of sleeping pills, enough to kill him. Fred Tokars lay on the bed, barely breathing. If he died, the truth about his wife's murder might die with him. Come on, Fred. Yes. Yes, there's been emergency. In late December of 1992, Fred Tokars, the once prominent Atlanta attorney now suspected in his wife's murder, lay motionless in a Florida hotel room from an overdose of sleeping pills. He was rushed to a nearby hospital where they were able to revive him. Um, thank you for coming down today. Um, After his release, he held a press conference. A really, uh, tough time for myself and also for my children. He told the public that he was very depressed and that the media was not making it easy. Tokars had gone to the extent of establishing residency in Florida to avoid the attention. But he believed that justice would soon be served. The FBI believed justice would soon be served as well. Convinced that Fred Tokars had used his business associate, Eddie Lawrence, to hire a hitman to kill Fred's wife, Sarah, the team of federal and local investigators would use federal racketeering statutes known as RICO to prosecute Tokars. Building a RICO case to prove Sarah Tokars had been killed to protect her husband's illegal activities meant outlining those activities in detail. The RICO statute. It attacks basically this conspiracy of individuals who are out committing all types of different crimes, not necessarily together, but they're all for the benefit of this, of this criminal group to exist, to continue to exist, and to make money. Looks like things are coming together a little bit. I appreciate all A federal grand jury named Tokars as an unindicted co-conspirator in the homicide. Though Tokar's partner, Eddie Lawrence, had remained silent after seven months in prison, investigators hoped the public indictment might encourage Lawrence to testify against Tokar's. Not long after, the Atlanta U.S. Attorney's Office received a phone call that Eddie Lawrence was ready to cooperate in exchange for sentencing consideration. For Lawrence's long-awaited statement, investigators secured a remote location in Georgia that would be monitored by chopper surveillance. DEA agent Jeff Dahlman was part of the team that needed to make sure nothing went wrong. We were there before Mr. Lawrence was brought in. Uh, his location had been kept a secret from everybody involved. Uh, the only people uh, that knew of where Mr. Lawrence was actually being held at that time were the Cobb County Police Department. Mr. Lawrence at that time was a key witness in this investigation and his safety was paramount to everyone. Inside a fortified house, Eddie Lawrence told investigators that he and Tokars were not just partners in the construction business. 
They were also involved in laundering drug money. Lawrence told FBI Special Agent Michael Twibel the details of the scheme. Mr. Tokars wanted him to try to solicit drug clients in the various nightclubs and bring them to him so he could launder their money. And in turn also set up Eddie Lawrence into several businesses. Lawrence owed his success to Tokars. He also owed the attorney $70,000 in business debts. Fred Tokars approached Eddie Lawrence indicating that, you know, that Sabre now was going to try to divorce him and take everything he had and he wasn't going to let that happen and he couldn't afford to allow her to do that to him and he wanted her killed. Okay. Um, Lawrence refused initially. Although he had been involved in drug dealing, he had never been involved in murder. Mr. Lawrence said, well, just let her have the house and the kids and the cars. And Mr. Tokar said, I've worked so hard, I'm not going to let her have it. Lawrence said that Tokar's planned the murder for several months. His first idea was to have Sarah shot in his office, but decided the couple's home was a better location. Tokar's was to pay Lawrence $25,000 for the hit. Mr. Lawrence advised that Mr. Tokars wanted to be out of town and that for Mr. Lawrence to commit the murder uh, as a burglary, basically uh, in front of his children, uh, which is very unusual. He told Mr. Lawrence that the kids would get over it, that they're young, and it wouldn't bother them saying that their mother was murdered. Lawrence admitted he didn't have the nerve to kill an innocent woman, so he hired Curtis Rohr. After Rohr shot Sarah Tokars, Lawrence drove him away from the scene. Since he cooperated, Lawrence earned 12 and a half years for his part in setting up the murder. The hitman he hired, Curtis Rohr, was sentenced to life without parole. For the time being, Tokars was still a free man. Mr. Tokars had custody of his two children. Our concern um, during this time and the rest of Mr. Tokars was that there could be some harm done to the children. And Mr. Tokars was, uh, was aware that he'd been watched the media was still down in Florida at the time. He knew that people were watching him daily, and we had to develop a plan to get Mr. Tokars out of the house where there'd be no harm done to the children or to himself, and, and tried to affect the arrest. The agents knew Tokars hated the press. They posed as reporters, lurking around the condo, hoping to elicit a response from the wanted man. And the game plan at that time was to have Mr. Tokars come out and check us out, which he had done previously to other people that had been parked in the area. The plan worked well. He came downstairs. He called the police. Local officers arrived, aware of the rules. Fred Tokars emerged from his condo to file a complaint. Instead, he was arrested. Fred Tokars pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. But separate state and federal juries found him guilty of racketeering, money laundering, murder for hire, and murder. He was sentenced to four life terms with no chance of parole for elevating his greed beyond the life of his wife and children. He will never be free again. In Memphis, Tennessee, a horrible crime terrified local residents. Most never heard the young mother's screams. 
but they felt the loss. As local authorities searched for the perpetrator, they found many who had motive. Investigators were forced to consider whether this was a random act of violence or a crime of deliberate calculation. wealthy young woman was abducted in front of her in-law's home, the police had no shortage of suspects. The 25-year-old victim left behind a tumultuous marriage, an ex-husband and old boyfriends. All were on the FBI's short list. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As suspects are interviewed, the case grew no clearer. To find the woman and her abductor, investigators would have to first determine the motive. Tunick County, Mississippi, just south of Memphis, Tennessee, is America's third largest gambling destination. 25-year-old Shannon Sanderson had recently become one of the regulars. On April 19, 1996, the housewife from nearby Memphis, Tennessee, visited her favorite casino. Shannon was having a good night. She managed to turn $500 into $5,000 at the high-stakes blackjack table. At 3.30 a.m., she cashed out and headed home. Um, sure. Can I have security? Security. When players win big, most casinos provide a security escort to protect customers from theft. This casino was no exception. Upon Shannon's request, a guard followed her to the parking area. Oh, it was great. It was an hour's drive to Shannon's home in Memphis through secluded roads. She knew the route well. She loved to win, but could afford to lose. Less than a year earlier, she'd married her boss, a multimillionaire who was 33 years her senior. Earlier that evening, she had dropped off her three young children from her previous marriage at the home of their grandparents in Northeast Memphis. It was about 4.45 a.m. when Shannon pulled into the grandparents' driveway to pick up her children. She needed to get them off to school on time in the morning. Did you hear that? Inside the house, Shannon's former in-laws were awakened by a piercing scream. Her former father-in-law rushed to the window to see Shannon struggling with someone in a baseball cap. He raced to assist her. Neighbors also heard the commotion and witnessed the crime. Within seconds, the mother of three had been abducted less than 50 feet from the front door. The distraught grandfather called 911. Memphis police were immediately dispatched. In kidnapping cases, a quick response can mean the difference between life and death. Police arrived within minutes and interviewed Shannon's former father. Memphis police captain Richard David Molson, a sergeant at the time, recalls that the shaken man did his best to recall what he had seen. Her ex-father-in-law heard a commotion and observed a car driving away. At the same time, some other neighbors on the street heard the commotion and, and also looked out and saw a car drive away and gave a description of the driver and description of the car. Despite the dim light, witnesses agreed that the driver had worn a red baseball cap 
but their descriptions of the vehicle varied. Some described it vaguely as dark colored and sporty. Another witness was certain that it was a maroon Chevy Beretta. None of them could describe the driver's face. Like I said, that was hard. On the driveway close to the street, police found two metal buttons assumed to have been torn from Shannon's clothing. Close by, they recovered a single artificial fingernail. The victim's car was searched, but police found nothing to suggest the identity of her abductor or Shannon's whereabouts. Her ex-father-in-law had seen Shannon earlier that evening when she had dropped off her children. He and his wife had agreed to babysit their grandchildren while Shannon celebrated her new husband's birthday at the casino. You guys, what's going on? Man, it's good to see you. Their former daughter-in-law had divorced their son less than a year before. Still, their relationship with her remained amicable, and she visited regularly with the children. Be good, all right? Shannon's former father-in-law told police the name of the casino where Shannon and her new husband liked to play. The casino confirmed she'd been there and won $5,000, but no one could say if she was with anyone in particular. Later that day, News that the mother of three was abducted just steps from where her children slept horrified local residents, according to Memphis District Attorney Jerry Kitchen. She appeared to be a person who was uh, very conscious about the upbringing of her children because she had uh, returned back to Memphis uh, to pick her children up to make sure that they got to school. Memphis police questioned Shannon's ex-husband, who was the father of her three children. Is anybody here with you after 11 No, sir. Okay. All right, yeah. No, thank you, brothers. Give me a gentleman a minute. Thanks, sweetie. He was at work when the abduction occurred in front of his parents' home. Um, Though his relationship with Shannon had been stormy, they remained married for almost eight years. They finally divorced after Shannon fell in love with her present husband. The Memphis police were reluctant to eliminate him as a suspect so early in the investigation, though Shannon's ex-husband's alibi was solid. Who knows the reason why people get a divorce, but there's always got, I've never heard of a good divorce. She still made him pay alimony, even though she was married to a wealthy person. And join us. Police looked to her present husband to learn more. Since he was a multimillionaire, they considered the possibility that Shannon may have been kidnapped for ransom. He owned a large security company here in Memphis, and he was well known. Everybody wanted to help him because they knew him or knew of him. And being that he was wealthy, she would be a prime target to be kidnapped for money. So far, he had received no ransom call or letter. He'd been distraught since being woken at 5 a.m. with the news of his wife's abduction. Regrettably, the last time they'd spoken that night, they'd had a fight. It was his 58th birthday, and his teenage daughters from a previous marriage had stopped by to celebrate. Happy birthday to you. That same evening, his wife Shannon had planned to take him to the casino. Hello? Hi, sweetie. After dropping off her children, she called to say that she was on the way to pick him up. He told her he wasn't ready. His daughters were there, and he wanted to spend more time with them before going out. No. Shannon became angry. According to her husband, she felt he was putting his children ahead of their plans. He told her he could be ready in a half hour, but she hung up on him. Hello? He expected that she'd cool down and pick him up. But when he tried to call later, she did not answer. She, she and I are just, uh, just, just sit down. I guess there's just such a difference in our age. Police asked if he knew anyone who might want to harm Shannon. 
last thing I said, she said to me was... The husband mentioned an ex-boyfriend against whom Shannon had filed charges of harassment a year earlier. He believed the ex-boyfriend drove a Chevy Beretta. At headquarters, police checked with DMV, but found no records that her ex-boyfriend or any of his family owned a Beretta. A criminal background check did confirm that a judge had ordered her ex-lover to have no contact with Shannon over the past year. Investigators went to question Shannon's ex-boyfriend, but he was not at home, nor had he shown up for work. His sister lived in the same neighborhood, a few blocks from where Shannon had been abducted. She reported that she had seen a suspicious car drive past her house on the night of the crime. She was out on the porch around the time of the abduction when a maroon Chevy Beretta sped by, heading out of the neighborhood. She said she didn't recognize the driver at first. Did you have to? But when she saw a photo of Shannon's wealthy husband in a news report, she was sure it was him. Though Memphis police had first considered the possibility that Shannon had been abducted for ransom, they now began to consider another possibility. It's always in the back of your mind to her being married to a wealthy person and the difference in their ages that uh, something could have happened to her to get rid of her. Um, there was, we just didn't know, so we tried to cover every angle that we could. Memphis police asked Shannon's husband to provide a formal statement. The reason I've asked you here today is... With his lawyer present, he filled in detectives about his relationship with Shannon. Police knew that he had met Shannon while she was still married, working at the security company he owned. She worked for him, but soon their relationship took a personal turn. Their romance led to marriage, but the magic didn't last long. There's nothing else that you can think of. Nine months later, they began negotiating a post-nuptial agreement, outlining terms in the event the troubled union broke. Both had previous marriages that ended in divorce, and Shannon needed to feel certain that she would retain custody of her children. They'd filed it just 10 days before Shannon's abduction. Feeling uh, sufficiently well to come to... Shannon's husband emphasized that it was his wife who wanted the agreement. He claimed money was not the issue since they kept separate bank accounts. You do realize that by refusing... When police asked, the husband agreed to reinforce his statement with a polygraph. This meeting. To cover all possibilities, police checked local morgues, jails, and hospitals. But after a week, investigators had no solid leads to Shannon's whereabouts. Police in Memphis received dozens of calls from local residents. Most were well-intentioned, really? but unproductive. Uh-huh. And, and your name again? All had to be checked. Yes, ma'am, and thanks for the call. One was from a woman named Sharon Powers in nearby Clarksdale, Mississippi, 80 miles south of Memphis. The abduction was reported in the paper and on the news, and a description of the car was given. She had contacted the Memphis Police Department saying that she thought that maybe her husband was involved uh, because of the description of the car. She told Mississippi police that she believed her husband, Lee, may fit the suspect description. The day after the crime was reported, he had worn a red cap and left town in their red Chevy Beretta to see his mother. The woman said that she and her husband had been fighting. Police asked her to have him call when he returned. They weren't optimistic. Her report sounded like a possible domestic dispute unrelated to the crime. On May 3rd, 1996, police responded to another call from a concerned citizen trying to help. At a casino in Tunica County, Mississippi, a witness believed he had spotted Shannon Sanderson dressed as a casino employee. May I help? 
But when an officer approached her, he realized that it was a case of mistaken identity. It was one more call among hundreds of false leads that frustrated the investigation. After two weeks of searching, local investigators were no closer to finding the missing mother of three. Her family was left only with the hope that she was still alive. In the spring of 1996, Memphis police continued their search for 25-year-old Shannon Sanderson, who had been abducted from the front of her former in-law's home. Investigators had questioned her wealthy husband, past lovers, and area residents, but none offered clues to her whereabouts. In any investigation, authorities try first to eliminate those people closest to the victim. After more than two weeks of searching, Memphis Police Captain Richard David Rolson feared that time was running out. Due to her past uh, boyfriends and lovers, we just didn't know what happened, but as the days went by, the chances of finding her alive were slimmer and slimmer. On May 6th, Shannon's ex-boyfriend finally came in for questioning. He had only recently completed his year-long probation of harassment charges against Shannon. He claimed to be asleep in his mother's house at the time of her abduction. According to the ex-boyfriend, he avoided Shannon as his probation required, but Shannon continued to call him, complaining that she wasn't happy with her new marriage. He added that he would have to talk to his lawyer before agreeing to take a polygraph. He remained a potential suspect. But as with Shannon's husband, no hard evidence existed to prove nor disprove his involvement. Then, on May 9, 1996, 40 miles south from where Shannon had been abducted, sheriffs in DeSoto County, Mississippi, were called to a rural plot of land in the town of Eudora. Two people had been inspecting their new property when they noticed a strong odor. Then they discovered a woman's decomposing body. The DeSoto County crime scene technicians set up a grid around the immediate area. Item. They conducted a line search, looking for anything that might be a clue. Go. They labeled and recorded every item they came item. across as they drew closer to the body. 15 feet away, they found a woman's high-heeled shoe. Go. Closer to the body, they marked the location of another. DeSoto sheriffs checked their records, but found no women reported missing locally. They broadened their search to include larger towns and cities in the region. When they contacted Memphis authorities, police there told them that a 25-year-old mother of three named Shannon Sanderson had been missing for more than two weeks. DeSoto deputies learned that she was blonde, approximately 5'5", 130 pounds, had a small tattoo, and was last seen wearing a dress, high heels, a jacket with metal buttons, and pink artificial fingernails. That description fit the body, but they needed an autopsy to confirm her identity and cause of death. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been killed by a single 25 caliber bullet to the right temple. Are you it, right? Yes, sir. Date and time. The victim's clothes were removed and preserved to check for trace evidence that might lead to the killer. The body, dead an estimated two to three weeks, was too decomposed to recognize. But over her left breast, examiners found a small tattoo that was still visible. It said, I love you, Robert. 
Shannon Sanderson had such a tattoo. The medical examiner compared her dental records to x-rays from the body. Okay, definitely They confirmed the ID. This was Shannon Sanderson's body. The abduction was now officially a homicide. In Memphis, Assistant District Attorney Jerry Kitchen was called in. His first task would be to somehow narrow the suspect list the police had developed over the past three weeks. Here in Memphis, it's somewhat unusual in that we have relatively few uh, murder cases that we would classify as mystery homicides where uh, someone's not either developed as a suspect rather quickly or arrested uh, soon after the incident. Um, but in this particular case, uh, it was a mystery uh, homicide with numerous suspects that uh, were listed as potentially being involved in the abduction and, and killing of the victim. The assistant district attorney first called the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation to conduct polygraph examinations to help eliminate potential suspects. He also contacted the FBI, since Shannon's body was found across the Tennessee state line. Supervisory Special Agent Jennifer Aiken from the FBI's Memphis field office was assigned as case agent. They felt they needed some additional resources the case was a very difficult case it crossed jurisdictions and they wanted the FBI to be involved as part of the team um, working towards a solution because it was it was not an easy an easy case Memphis authorities hoped that agent Aiken's experience would help unravel the complexities of this case local residents were fearful that Shannon's killer was still out there not knowing if or when he would strike again. In the spring of 1996, the body of 25-year-old Shannon Sanderson, a mother of three, was found in Eudora, Mississippi, 40 miles from her Memphis, Tennessee home. The FBI, together with state and local investigators, needed to shorten the lengthy suspect list that included Shannon's husband and past lovers. Assistant District Attorney Jerry Kitchen hoped polygraph examinations could help focus their search. This investigation was difficult in that there were a lot of suspects in this particular case. Throughout the victim's life, she had, of course, been divorced. And naturally, in any type of murder case, so uh, you, some, you, you do focus in and you do look at uh, relatives or acquaintances or husbands, uh, any type of relationship that the victim may have been involved in that uh, uh, could uh, lead back to some type of dispute or domestic uh, violence. Tennessee state authorities tested several of Shannon's ex-lovers. They asked them their whereabouts on the night of the abduction. They asked directly if they had abducted or killed Shannon. All denied any involvement. The tests revealed no deception. Investigators corroborated their alibis and eliminated them as potential suspects. They also polygraphed the witness who claimed to have seen Shannon's current husband driving a maroon Chevy Beretta in the neighborhood moments before the abduction occurred. It was the same type of vehicle other witnesses had described that Shannon was forced into. But the woman was found to be deceptive. These are Becky's charts. Her Though police now believed her claim was false, that she had seen Shannon's husband driving the getaway vehicle, they also knew that Shannon's brief marriage with her wealthy husband had been rocky. They wanted to confirm once and for all that he had not been involved in any way. This question about honesty and what she had This crime occurred at 4 o'clock in the morning. The victim's husband had indicated that he went to bed and that there was no one else that he was with. And so he really had no alibi. And so that was an area that was difficult for us to get over uh, because we could not lock down exactly where he was and what he was doing without, uh, other than what he was telling us. Investigators contacted Shannon's husband to be polygraphed. 
though he had previously agreed to do so. On advice from his lawyer, he declined. Heart medication that he was taking may have induced a false reading, according to his lawyer. Are you feeling? For Captain Rolson, the husband's refusal didn't alleviate the suspicions that surrounded him. You couldn't understand if he didn't have anything to do with it, why he wouldn't be wanting to cooperate. And being a homicide detective, you're suspicious, and and. Uh, it just made him that more suspicious. In terms of incriminating evidence, the investigation was at a standstill. Supervisory Special Agent Jennifer Aiken hoped to refocus the investigation by examining leads that may have been overlooked. We have to look at all of the possibilities, and, and that's you know part of the battle in the beginning, is not to get too far down the road in speculating about what kind of of guy this could be, um, and and what you know, what his relationship or no, you know non-relationship would be to the victim. What we did then is identify what else, what other possibilities um, uh, do we still need to explore. One possibility, though not a promising one was Sharon Powers, who earlier reported that her husband may have matched the vague description of the suspect. But now she wasn't so sure about her previous claim. She told police she'd overreacted, reinforcing their belief that she'd only been trying to get back at her husband for leaving her. She said that her husband had left town, that they had had some, you know, marital disputes. They felt that perhaps um, this report was really just sort of sour grapes and that she was trying to get her husband, um, maybe a estranged husband, into trouble of some kind. And so they really just simply did not know how much weight to give uh, this rather conflicting and, and kind of half-hearted story that she was telling. Though her husband wasn't a serious suspect, police wanted to talk with him. A bulletin for Gerald Lee Powers was issued that he was wanted for questioning in Tennessee. FBI agents and Tennessee investigators met to review the casino surveillance tape of the blackjack table where Shannon had won the now missing $5,000. Her growing pile of chips would certainly make her an attractive target. They viewed the tape to see if a stalker could be seen. But if that was the killer's intention, Agent Aiken questioned why he would wait so long to make his move. Clearly, she had been winning for a while. She was there late at night. There were a number of factors that made her visit to that casino rather high risk. And yet, we had this abduction occurring almost an hour to an hour and a half after she left that environment. So first, we had to determine, did it have anything or nothing to do with her visit to that casino. The tape showed Shannon, but was inadequate to reveal whether she was being stalked. Investigators were no closer to finding the truth. As they contemplated what to do next, the investigation veered in an unexpected direction. On May 22, 1996, near Hebronville, Texas, 750 miles from where Shannon was seen forced into a car described as a Chevy Beretta, a vehicle fitting that description erratically swerved away from a border checkpoint. The vehicle had Mississippi plates. One of the patrol guards raced after it, believing the driver to be a potential border jumper or smuggler. In May of 1996, as the investigation continued into the kidnapping and murder of a young Tennessee mother, U.S. Border Patrol agents chased down a fleeing maroon Chevy Beretta with Mississippi plates, the type of car described by witnesses in the abduction. Caught at a dead end, the suspect resisted. Drop it! Drop the knife! Up against the car! Up against the car! Then backed down when confronted by the agent's gun. 
He had 14 $100 bills in his pocket. The driver said his name was Gerald Lee Powers, but held no driver's license to prove it. A cursory search of the car revealed no illegal drugs or aliens. But in the trunk, border agents recovered a stolen weapon registered in Arkansas. The car was locked and remained in that spot under armed guard until FBI agents could conduct a more thorough search. Special Agent Evan Ray from the FBI field office in Laredo, Texas was contacted since assaulting a border patrol officer is a federal offense. Agent Ray confirmed the identity of the driver when he learned that Gerald Lee Powers had been involved in another altercation at the Mexican border. Uh, I spoke to U.S. Customs Service officials who uh, had indicated that they had had an incident that day as well in which an individual had fled and had left several pieces of identification behind on the counter when they fled. And so we were then in possession of uh, several pieces of identification of Mr. Powers. A license plate check revealed that the vehicle was registered to his wife, Sharon, in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Agent Ray also discovered that Gerald Lee Powers had a violent past and was currently wanted for questioning in the abduction and murder of Shannon Sanderson. After contacting Memphis authorities, he traveled to Hebronville to process Powers' car on site. The Chevy Beretta matched the vehicle witnesses had described at the abduction. Agents hoped something inside would link the vehicle and powers to the murder of Shannon Sanders. A sheet and pillowcase, along with the trunk liner, were bundled into evidence bags. All right, let's tape this stuff up. We'll get it back to headquarters. When you're retrieving evidence like that, you have no idea what the results of the laboratory examinations are going to be in the end. You uh, just try to get the best uh, and the most evidence that you can and let the lab do their job. Agents were less hopeful they'd find something in the car's interior since it appeared to have been recently cleaned and vacuumed. Hundreds of miles from the nearest evidence response team, Agent Ray improvised with the tools he had at hand. One item that we needed to search for were hairs and fibers in the back seat area. We didn't have the specialized equipment that the evidence response team would have, and so I used an, an unopened lint roller that I had at the office of the type one might use on a, on a suit to, as an adhesive lift. Initially obscured by the front seat, the agent found a pink artificial fingernail on the floor. It was similar to those the victim had worn at the time of her abduction. Memphis prosecutor Jerry Kitchen believed this could be the clue that could definitely place Shannon Sanderson in Powers' car. Agent Ray had called us and told us that he had found a fingernail in the back seat area of the uh, floorboard of this vehicle, which is where we had felt that, based upon the witnesses' uh, uh, information they had given us, that, that the victim had been placed in the back seat of the vehicle that took her away. Memphis authorities came to Laredo to question Gerald Lee Powers about the murder. Powers told them that he knew nothing more than what he'd heard on the news. He admitted to being at the casino that night, but had left early to check on his terminally ill neighbor. While the interview continued, investigators spoke to his neighbor in Clarksdale, Mississippi, who denied that Powers had been there at that time. We weren't 100% convinced Gerald Powers was our suspect. We just felt it was kind of suspicious that he was, he was trying to give a false alibi. And that, of course, the neighbor was very ill and could have been mistaken because he had been there at different times. Investigators hoped that Powers' wife, Sharon, might be able to corroborate the neighbor's statement. 
She had initially told police her husband fit the description of the suspect who witnesses glimpsed at the abduction, a man who wore a red baseball cap. Now she added that he made frequent trips to the casino where the victim had spent her last night. Still, she did not know if he had visited their neighbor that night and denied that her husband had anything to do with the abduction and murder of Shannon Sanderson. Investigators feared they might just be wasting their time, but FBI Special Agent Jennifer Aiken wasn't so sure. We sensed her ambivalence. We knew that she, you know, had come forward, even with her kind of half-hearted story, we knew she'd come forward for a reason and that there was more she needed to tell. Seconds later, Gerald Lee Powers... Agent Aiken realized that she would need to invest a great deal of time to develop the trust of Sharon Powers. As the dialogue with Sharon Powers continued over several weeks, the FBI contacted Tom Scott, director of surveillance at the casino where the victim had gambled prior to her abduction. Scott was asked to confirm if Gerald Lee Powers had been recorded that same night on any of the 600 cameras in the 95,000 square foot casino. Jennifer Aiken from the FBI gave us a, uh, a basic description of what the suspect possibly was wearing on the night in question. Um, and that's what we went with it was a, as a general description of from color shoes to jeans to a, a certain type jacket and possibly a ball cap. Any given day, uh, you can have approximately 3,000 to 10,000 people within a casino. Scott and his team searched hundreds of hours of footage looking for a man in a red baseball cap and yellow shirt. Their main focus was the blackjack table where Shannon spent most of the night. If the suspect was stationary, it's, it's pretty easy. But uh, in a casino, it's quite an exciting place to be in and everybody kind of wanders around. And they go to slot machine to slot machine or restaurants or table games. We could not locate the individual. Investigators looked to Sharon Powers for more detail about her husband's activities that night. They did what they could to make her feel comfortable. One of her neighbors, a police officer, provided her with reassurance and support. She was a woman torn between her empathy for the victim and her feelings towards her husband. She was in love with this man. I think it was difficult for Sharon to accept the fact that the victim had been a mother of three young children. Um, she herself was a mother of three children and uh, very much related uh, to the victim. Slowly, Sharon Powers worked through her internal conflict. She began to open up, revealing what her home life was like with her husband, Gerald Lee Powers. She said he ruled the house. Her three kids from previous marriages were afraid of him. Sharon admitted that she was too. He kept a bell on his chair. When he rang, Sharon came running. Despite his controlling temper, her feelings for him were deep. This is a woman who had really kind of lived under the thumb of uh, Gerald Lee Powers for a, a number of years. I believe by then they had been married four or five years. And uh, she, um, I don't want to say liked it that way, but that was what she was used to. That was familiar. Um, it, was not, uh, it was not familiar to her to be breaking with him, to be disloyal. Despite her fear, Sharon continued to open up to investigators. On April 19th, the day Shannon Sanderson was abducted, Gerald came home acting nervous. Sharon was angry because she thought he'd spent the night with another woman. She noticed blood on his shirt and a cut on his arm. He claimed he'd fallen down at a casino he'd been visiting. Do you remember what color the shirt was? Sharon didn't believe what he told her, but she didn't press it. For now, Sharon refused to say any more, and neither would her husband. Without something stronger, Prosecutor Jerry Kitchen would be unable to press charges on Gerald Lee Powers. 
we still didn't have anything concrete that he had been involved in. It was just an uh, instinct, uh, I think, that uh, was, was leading us at this point that he was our man, but at the time we did not have the results back from the lab. Investigators hoped the FBI would reinforce their hunch that Gerald Lee Powers was responsible for leaving Shannon Sanderson's children motherless. In the summer of 1996, after Gerald Lee Powers was indicted for assaulting a border patrol officer in Texas, the FBI and Memphis investigators suspected he was also responsible for the murder of a 25-year-old mother of three. But lacking physical evidence, Memphis prosecutor Jerry Kitchen was unable to charge Powers for his involvement or to know for certain if one of the victim's former lovers had hired him to commit the crime. There was always that possibility. Uh, the way she was killed and the manner in which she was abducted, that it appeared like it wasn't just something random, that it had been something planned. All the other suspects that appeared to have a motive or possibly uh, uh, emotional reasons why someone would, would want to have someone killed, like jealousy or rage or uh, other uh, factors. What river? Investigators hoped the suspect's wife, Sharon Powers, could tell them more. Though reluctant at first, after many meetings over several weeks, Sharon grew more comfortable. She finally opened up to FBI Special Agent Jennifer Aiken. When she finally told the story in, in, in its entirety, um, what we heard was really a chilling tale of, of his stalking of the victim and, uh, and the abduction of the victim and then taking her to this rural area and, uh, and robbing her of, of not only the $5,000 that she had won that night, but also of, of the jewelry that she was wearing. Sharon's story was strong, but without corroborating evidence, it would not be enough to convict or even indict Gerald Lee Powers for murder. Trying to help, she told investigators that her husband had thrown the murder weapon, a handgun, into an abandoned canal near the casino in Mississippi. Memphis Police Captain Richard Rolson accompanied local divers to help search for the handgun. Sheriff's Department's divers dove into this hole and cr crawled inch by inch searching for this pistol. We never did locate it. And then that's when Miss Powers told us that he had thrown it into the river, which was about 100 yards away. The current at that location was too swift for anybody to dive in the Mississippi River. It left investigators with more doubt and no corroboration that Sharon Powers was telling them the truth. The suspect's wife also told them about a school bus driver from Mississippi whom her husband believed had seen him close to where he dumped Shannon's body. Did you happen to notice the driver? No, I didn't know. Police tracked down the driver who confirmed Sharon's story. At 7 a.m., about two hours after Shannon Sanderson had been abducted, the driver noticed a maroon Chevy Beretta backing down the dirt roadway of the vacant property where the victim's body was later found. The bus driver remembered it because the property had been vacant for so long. Okay, that's what we need to know. Um, but the driver didn't see who was in the car and didn't get the license plate. But I did notice the car. Searching for further corroboration, investigators turned to Tom Scott, director of surveillance at the casino. This time, Sharon Powers provided them locations of where to look for her husband in the 95,000 square foot casino. We did a recreation and did a walkthrough on where, if we were the suspect, where we would have gone through certain areas. And we pulled some tapes. Eventually, we were able to identify just from his shoes in a particular location where the suspect was standing. We pulled a bunch more shots, connected the shoes, we finally put some legs to the shoes, and were able to identify a person in a distant shot walking through the casino from the upstairs looking down towards the suspect. We then connected more shots and followed the suspect down an escalator, walking past the table where this uh, victim was playing and 
follow the uh, suspect out through our front door on videotape. The video was compelling and confirmed Gerald Lee Powers was in the casino that night, but it didn't prove that he had abducted or murdered Shannon Sanderson. Hoping for physical evidence that would connect Powers to the victim, investigators searched behind a tavern in Mississippi where Powers' wife claimed he had buried the victim's jewelry. The suspect had told her they were wrapped in tinfoil under a couch in the back. Just as Mrs. Powers described, investigators located a small bundle of foil. Inside, they found pink plastic wrap holding rings identified by the victim's husband as belonging to Shannon. Now they needed to prove forensically that Gerald Lee Powers had in fact been the one who wrapped them. Investigators went to Powers' home to search for the source of that plastic. In the kitchen, they found a roll of pink wrap. They forwarded the roll along with the bundled rings to the lab for comparison. While they waited for the results, investigators turned their attention to the pink artificial nail found inside Powers' car after he was arrested in Texas. From autopsy photos, investigators found at least two nails were missing from the victim's hand. If the nail from the car matched those remaining on the victim's hand, it would prove that Shannon had been in Powers' car that night. But there was a problem. Shannon had already been buried, and her husband was against exhuming her remains. She had already been interred, and so we had uh, a hearing in court to have her uh, disinterred and uh, to have the ability to examine these fingernails to see if they were in fact uh, her fingernails or not. Against her husband's wishes, the judge ordered the body exhumed. In early July, three months after the murder, investigators retrieved the body of Shannon Sanderson. The remaining artificial nails were removed and sent to the lab for comparison with the others. The results were negative. The nail in the car wasn't hers. Investigators hoped the other evidence at the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. would provide more promising results. Inside the tinfoil ball recovered in Mississippi, Examiners removed the pink plastic wrap wound tightly around some rings. The FBI needed to connect the rings physically to Gerald Lee Powers. To do so, examiners compared the plastic they were wrapped in to the sample retrieved from Powers' home. The FBI uh, agent who examined it indicated that it wasn't the exact piece that uh, was, was torn off, but that it matched that roll exactly as far as the polymers and the dye and all that which showed that this was the source that the, uh, the material had come from that was wrapped around the rings. It was the first piece of forensic evidence linking powers to the victim. But the case was by no means complete. More compelling proof came from a single fiber among several found in Power's otherwise immaculate car. We have uh, dress fiber uh, that was found in the vehicle that he was driving that night that matches the fiber from the dress that the victim was wearing. Um, and that was very significant as well. Authorities were convinced that Gerald Lee Powers had murdered Shannon Sanderson, but they weren't convinced he'd acted alone. They believed it was possible that others from her past could claim a motive for wanting Shannon dead. Memphis prosecutor Jerry Kitchen decided to confirm it with Powers himself. So we went to Laredo to interview uh, the defendant before we charged him with this murder. Uh, and there was the possibility if he cooperated and was able to prove to us that someone else was involved, that we would withdraw seeking the death penalty. Uh, but there was nothing that he was able to provide us with, so we were convinced then at that point that no one else had been involved in her uh, abduction and murder. 
and proceeded uh, with charging him alone. Powers had plenty of time to contemplate this murder. He watched her for several hours in the casino, then followed her for another hour back to Memphis. He had ample time to change his mind. Instead, he hardened his resolve. Get out of there! Move. He abducted a mother of three, robbed her, on, then up. shot her at point blank. Get in there. The criminal court in Tennessee didn't need much time to decide Power's fate. After deliberating only 15 minutes, the jury recommended death for the murder of Shannon Sanderson. Gerald Lee Powers awaits execution at Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Tennessee. <laughs> 